got a very special episode for you today. We've got two people who are very immersed in banking, two managing directors from Raymond James. We've got Randy Woodward, uh, managing director, and then we've got John Tuhig, who is the head of whole loan trading. So Randy, you work with John. Can you just explain for the audience and for me, why is it so special that we have John here? What is John's uh, knowledge of the inner of inner workings of the banking system, and particularly what's going on right now? How he has a glimpse of you know what people are going to be talking about in six months. Just frame that for the audience, just to start off, Randy, please. Yeah, <clears throat> I want to make it really, really simple. So when banks business, they get your deposits. Generally, there's two things they're going to do. Primarily, they want to loan the money out. They're going to get the most yield that way. And if they can't loan it all out, and for other reasons where they got to have liquidity, they invest that with me. It's really quite that simple. That's the that's what banks do, you know, coast to coast. Um, there's probably 2,000 of me. So the guys that do what I do, we got eyes on, you know, bank portfolios, securitized portfolios. And, you know, we see things most people just don't get to see. Now, when it goes to loans, the bank can lend the money to their clients. Sometimes they got so much money like they did in 2021, they got to go out and try to buy loans from other banks around the country that are willing to sell them. That's what John does. There's dozens of what John does, meaning hardly any at all. I just posted some on Twitter. I call John a unicorn because it, there's so few of him that have eyes on lending coast to coast in all sectors of lending. And what's amazing about what John gets to see, he gets to see every single data point on all loans that are run through his desk, uh, on all lending that, I, you know, from, from all our clients. So he's seeing things, I think, he's seeing what's happening in lending well before it's hitting media, well before anybody else sees it. And that's why I was really super excited to do this because I'm, you know, I, I want to know too, what are we heading into? What's coming? You know, we've had all these bank failures for various reasons that are, they're all actually all pointing at my world. Oh my God, the securities portfolio is terrible, which is completely not the case by the way. But John's world moves a little slower and it, the waves are coming. And that's what I want to find out from John how bad is this going to get? We're seeing a lot of lending tightening and less volume. And what does that mean? And that's what we're going to discover today. All right. So, so John, we, we've set you up. What are you seeing now in the lending? What was the lending world looking like and the trading of loans looking like before March 10th, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank? And what has it looked since then? Well, one, thank you for the very kind introductions. I don't know, Randy, that I can live up to the hype that you put there, but, but well done. I feel... Uh, I feel quite uh, puffed up here at the moment, but no, it's um, yeah. Looking at those loans, looking at the balance sheets, uh, it, the analytics to the portfolio. I mean, when we just think of banks and we think of depositories, the securities book, which is all of the unrealized losses that you're talking about, usually represents about twenty percent of the assets on a balance sheet. The loan book's about sixty percent. So. This is where the lion's share of the assets are. And to Randy's point, what happened with Silicon Valley, what happened with First Republic and, and others, is an unrealized loss that turned into a realized loss pretty quickly, largely just due to interest rates. It had nothing to do with credit. Um, it was nothing like 2008. It was all driven by just rising interest rates or run on deposits. Those deposits run out the door. And, and, and we can talk about that here in a little bit. But to specifically answer your question, as we're looking at portfolios, uh, institutions right now are really battling their cost of funds, rising deposits. Those dollars are going up. As they start to look at borrowing costs, if they were to go to the Federal Home Loan Bank today, the discount window, uh, the new BTFP program that was uh, brought into place after SVB, um, you know, these, these are, it's expensive money. We, we've come from a period of essentially zero rates for a very long period of time to now four and a half, five percent kind of borrowing costs. Um, it, it's it's a shock. So lenders are having to to raise their rates if they want to maintain that same margin, and, and that's a war. That's a war right now that's going on between the CFO and the treasurer who's holding the purse strings and the loan officer out there who wants to go make loans. 
the loan officer has a whole lot easier time to make loans at, at lower rates. It's easier to, to issue that loan at higher rates. It's harder to qualify from a, from a credit standpoint and from an origination standpoint. So we are starting to see those volumes fall. It's different in different segments of lending. I think mortgage is pretty well documented right now. Mortgage rates around 7%. Uh, you know, that's a real challenge. I saw a research article today saying that less than 1% of all mortgage-backed securities right now are in the money for a refi. That goes to show you just how dead the refi business is in, in Resi land. And Resi is probably the most transparent because you have Fannie and Freddie out there. You have a regulated entity. When you start looking at, say, like auto originations, you mentioned citizens. Indirect autos, those aren't core members. Those aren't core borrowers. That is a dealer bringing you a loan and you're paying that dealer for sourcing that loan. You're not getting deposits on that auto loan. You're, you're, you know, you're essentially making the loan, which is wonderful, but you're not getting anything back from that particular consumer. That's why you're starting to see depositories shy away from those indirect channels of lending. So what, what, what John's describing, this indirect lending is really important. Someone goes into auto dealer, says, I'm going to buy the car, and the, and the dealer takes the loan and goes to the credit union and or the bank, says, would you like this to do this loan? And the idea is, yes, not just the asset, but also, ooh, we might be able to turn that guy into a depositor, into another client. I, I, it doesn't happen. I mean, my own clients are admitting that. Maybe this a ten percent success work. rate. Maybe. Yeah, and, and what John also alluded to earlier was, and I think it's a fascinating aspect that very few people understand about banking. I didn't. It took me years to figure it out. Is you know, you kind of feel like the CEO is really powerful, the CFO is real powerful, and you know they run the bank, and the senior lender, the the lenders are, you know, they work there and they sell, you know, basically get loans. What I've found through my careers, the power senior lender is is sometimes much greater than the CFO. So he wants to do the indirect lending. He wants to do any kind of lending he can get because that's what he's getting paid on. The CFO is going, he's the one looking at the numbers, the blood of the company going, wait, 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 what are you doing? You have to stop. You're doing it too low. You're doing too much. You're creating risks. But in, in my experience, you know, it seems to lean towards the senior lender winning the argument. And so, well, and right now, Randy, that's that starting through. to turn, right? I agree exactly. with everything you just said. So, we're, Which we're means tighter credit. That's right. Right. That's my theme here. I want to keep pointing. There's so many things pointing to tighter credit. And I'm talking about availability of credit. It, right. it is, it to me, is, is lowering fairly dramatically. And that's what I want to, you know, get more from you. Jim. And, and credit means two different things as I've kind of, worked to communicate this over the last six to 12 months, I, there's plenty of loan demand. They could make the loan if they wanted to from a 600 FICO score to an 800 FICO score. So that is pure FICO credit, consumer credit. When you say credit is being restricted, they're making fewer loans. To me, that's because they're running out of cash mm -hmm. or they're looking at those borrowing costs and it's becoming difficult for them to make the margins that they need. So they're, they're pulling back from lending, not presently in my opinion, because they're worried about the credit risk. No. It's worried more about the funding pressures. Uh -huh. It's a nuance, but I want right. to make sure that gets said. But, it's not 2008. Know. We're not yeah. in the 2008 right. kind of moment. Not, well, not yet. Uh, let me, let me break down a few things. So in 2020 fed dropped interest rates to zero money was basically free, free. people were uh, depositing money and banks were paying them essentially zero maybe 25 basis points 0.25 sure. percent so money was free so you could make loans you could make a mortgage loan at three percent you could make an auto loan at five percent or a commercial loan a commercial real estate loan at four percent and you can earn a very very healthy spread that is no longer the case that's over the era of zero percent money at least for non you know giant banks is, is very much over. We're seeing deposit costs go to what, 2%, 3%, John, you can work, work rising, math. rising regularly. Yes. So if you're, if you're now making a mortgage at 3% or an auto loan at 5%, the math doesn't work. Those loans are going to be underwater from a profitability standpoint, unless you raise your rates. So if the market was perfectly efficient and your know, CFOs were per perfectly in charge, maybe the auto rate now would be 10%. The commercial real estate loan would be 7%, 8%. But to the extent that you're seeing originations <sighs> below that, John, 
Tell us why is that not the case and how does that hinge upon that uh, relationship between the sales team and the treasury, which I think is that's really the loan important. officer winning. That's not the, the CFO winning the argument, right? I mean, that, that's exactly the battle that, that Randy was describing a moment ago. And that's because left hand doesn't always talk to right hand, right? Sales wants to go make loans. It's their job. They get paid on volume, right? CFO's job is man and margin. Uh, manage credit, manage you know the overall balance sheet. The, those two items can be at war. Uh, and, and in the go-go days, when money was free, I mean, if we could rewind to that moment too, because you, you you bring a, an interesting point. There's been a lot of revisionist history here lately. If we if we go back to the beginning of of of, of those rates just being ultra low, and we can remember that first quarter, the pressure on CFO was earnings. They needed to get all of this money that was flooding in the door out and lent or put into a bond and managing more. They, they were loan to share ratios, loan to deposit ratios in the 40s and 50s because all these deposits just rushing in the door. The pandemic for lenders was a real problem. People weren't going into branches, if you can remember. Loans are made in the branch. There's an online component to it as well. But it was very difficult for a mortgage to be made. You couldn't get a notary. You couldn't get into a house for an appraisal. You couldn't get uh, to the county to get it recorded. All of the the grits of what make that up. So, you know, as as lenders were trying to work through the work from home story, lending struggled for a minute. And so that was one of the reasons a lot of the dollars went into bonds. You could buy the bond in a blink. You had a hard time making the loans. So at the same time that rates were next to zero and, and, and near zero, lenders were trying to make loans, but couldn't. As that slowly worked out about October of 2020, when we all realized we were going to survive the pandemic and the world wasn't going to come to an end, then you felt the floodgates of loans start to turn back on, right? So deposits came in, deposits were really high, but loan volume was really low. Now we're starting to see that go the other way around as loan volumes have skyrocketed and deposits are starting to go out the door, creating those funding pressures as they go up. So that's that's usually a lagging indicator. Something that I see probably before the rest of the market sees as these CFOs and these production folks are starting to battle one another. I, I take a bit of exception with the the talking heads in, in the news media that these community banks were reckless in how they they made these loans. No, if we go back to that. You know, we, their job is to lend and make and, and manage. Inflation was transitory in that moment. Rates were only going to go up a little bit if they went up. We, we didn't think they would go from zero to 400 basis points in a snap, right? So um, that pace, it's the steepest pace we've seen since the 80s that the Fed has raised rates. It, it caught most every community, regional, super regional, flat-footed in that their funding costs are starting to skyrocket. Throw on a banking crisis, a couple of failed banks to go on it, which is just gasoline on the fire. It, it makes it a, an even more interesting conversation. Blessedly, credit hasn't cracked. Performance, loan performance hasn't cracked. That, that's been the good news so far. Right now, all we're talking about is funding pressure. Powell can fix that with an instantaneous 200 basis point cut. All of those unrealized losses disappear until... Inflation stays higher, whatever credit issues start to kind of creep their way into, unemployment starts to rise. That's something the Fed can't put back into the bottle if that occurs. So, John, just to underscore for folks, your role, you really are sitting at the center between different intermediaries, a bank who wants to sell a loan, yep. another bank who has a hole in the balance sheet, they want to buy a loan. So when yep. activity, when that lending activity is robust and you have a you know, everyone's making loans, everyone wants to trade loans. A lot. I bet you know on your floor, a lot of phone calls being made, a lot of activity happening. You know, I've you know the sort of a, a um, narrative is for for on a trading floor when every everyone goes silent, that's when you know there could start to be a little bit of trouble. What are you seeing in terms of the liquidity of of loans? If a bank say they made a commercial real estate loan, the credit's okay. You know, and back in the day, they could sell it at ninety five cents on the dollar, no problem. When they call you or when you know when they want to sell a loan, what is that process looking like now? What are you seeing in the liquidity? On, on for loans, and I guess we can you know move on to a, a commercial real estate, which I know you. you, know, you yeah, let, let, let's pick on mortgage for a second. We can pick an auto too, but mortgage is an easy one just because it's a it's a pretty transparent market. Um, we made a lot of really low mortgages, a lot of thirty year fixed rate really low mortgages, three and a half percent and down. What I call the forever 
loan. I mean, nobody's going to give up that mortgage, right? And we're seeing CPR speeds two to 4%. I mean, that's, I thought people died faster than that, right? I mean, it's CPR just is prepayment. constant prepayment speed. Okay, yeah, yeah. The, the prepayment rate at which the refis are happening, right? So um, that loan today, ignoring credit, just, just rate, uh, three to three and a half percent coupons in the low 80s. Again, current mortgage rates around six and a half to seven percent today. It, it's just math, right? Ignoring credit for a moment and coming to somebody and say, "Listen, Mr. Customer, if you'd like to sell that mortgage, there's a market for it. It's liquid, but you're going to take a fifteen point haircut in price." Most CFOs will say, "Thank you, no thank you. Too much pain, too much blood. I'm going to leave it in portfolio, and I'm going to forget about it." So the other side of the conversation is the more current loan, let's just say a six and a half to 7% loan that you could sell at a premium today. Again, looking at it from the CFO standpoint, that's your highest earning margin loan on the balance sheet. That's the one that's actually bringing you in some interest income right now, which is a benefit to the balance sheet. Now, if you need to sell a loan and not impair the capital or the net worth of the bank, you as a CFO have a choice. You can work with the income statement and keep those 7% loans, which will be generating the interest income over time, or you can penalize the balance sheet and sell the 3.5% at a loss and a discount and harm net worth. It's an ugly decision for a CFO to have to kind of make, particularly in the fact that if he's trying to raise funds to continue to make more loans, do you want to sell your worst earner? at a current rate? Or do you want to take a loss on a loan that's deeply underwater simply because rates have kind of moved? Where is that happy medium in between? So Jack, to answer your question specifically, that's the battle the CFO is kind of having to entertain. Trading volumes have slowed because CFOs are wrestling with what loan do I want to sell? Everybody would love to sell loans at 103, and that was 2021 and 2020 on the latter part. It was easy. Rates were falling. Every loan you made, you could immediately sell at a premium. It was a wonderful period of time where really all you had to do was show up and take the phone call. Now you're having to really do the analytics. You're really having to roll up the sleeves, and you're having to say, if I sell a loan today, it's probably going to be at a loss. How long is it going to take me to earn out of that loss over time to make sure that the transaction makes sense? So I'd love to sell $100 million of loans right now, but I really only have $20 million that work. And that's the trade that's happening in the moment today. So trading volumes down larger because the the math is ugly. So, John, if I were to pick up someone at random, a regional bank's balance sheet, and they said, oh, we've got... Uh, you know, eleven billion dollars of loans. You know, is it possible that if they were to, if they needed to sell those loans, they were to, you know, pick up a call, call Raymond James, call your office, they would be. Uh, It'd be a significant to, they discount. Would a, they would get a lot less than eleven billion dollars. And blessedly, I don't live in Randy's world of bonds, where I don't have mark to market, right? Where bonds could be, you know, that that was really candidly First Republic, and the issue that they kind of ran flat into. The loan book doesn't have to be marked to market. It's held to maturity for most part. Mm -hmm. Um, So to Randy's point earlier, we've kind of lived the bond issue. We haven't even started to talk about the loan issue because my example of the mortgage at seven and three and a half was purely a rate conversation. The moment it's a rate and a credit conversation, that's when things get gnarly. Fortunately, we haven't had to have that conversation yet today. Again, my theme is less volume, you know, of of credit availability. Okay. And one of the things I think First Republic ran into is they were 95% loan to value. So, or loan to deposit. deposit. They didn't have BTFP collateral. They didn't have that much. So those loans had to go to the home loan bank or the discount window which is going to be at par value, less a haircut. I think they ran out of borrowing capacity. They did. Right. And so, and they sure as hell can't sell the loans because then they recognize that massive loss. It it, it was a catch 22. They're done. And so So, John, I guess my question to you on that is, do you think regulators, now we we haven't mentioned regulators, but we know that's coming. Right. And, and, and let me just, let me say this 100%, let everybody know this. 
when they say, oh, these new regulations are only for banks over 100 billion or 250 billion, that's BS. Those regulations, even if they're not official, will bleed down to all banks. So my question, John, is, is it possible that banks or credit unions with high loan to, to deposit or share are going to pull in that a little bit, you know, which again means we're going to lend less, have less loans on the books. Sure. So we have some liquidity available for BTFP if we need it. Or for Jack, sales. Could you, could you pull up page six of that presentation that I had shot over to you, the one that says TTI on it? Yes. I, I think, Randy, this really kind of highlights what you're talking about. So uh, a phrase TTI that we haven't had to talk about since the 80s in the savings and loan crisis, but this is a graph that will give CFOs nightmares for years. So this is the balance sheet of First Republic provided by S&P over the last several quarters. Um, what you've been reading a lot about is that dark bar on the bottom where you see the 72.42, the 75.21, the 69.93. Those are non-interest bearing checking accounts, right? That's just people parking cash. That's dumb money, if you will. People who aren't necessarily watching um, to, to get four or 5% out of money market or whatever it might be. Right. Um, that's right. That, that, that's what most depositories make their living off of. They give a, a very low cost of funds there. They get to take that money and lend it back out. You can see how it was slowly kind of dipping down between Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. What's remarkable is the run right? What happened when you kind of have a billionaire's bank like this and how quickly those non-interest bearing checking went out, how they had to immediately tap to, to Randy's point a minute ago, $63 million worth of the discount window, uh, how their time deposits, their more CD uh, deposits shot up, how their federal home loan bank advances, another kind of third party uh, wholesale source of funding, if you will. To see the the time to insolvency, which back in the 80s was a, a slow melting ice cube, just to use the quote from the article that I'm using here from S&P, the speed at which information travels through the internet now and through financial reporting caused their balance sheet to shift this quickly. And it really happened the matter of about four weeks. That's a full quarter that they show there where in theory, their net interest margin went negative because their borrowing and liabilities went north of what their assets would be. Um, this is what Randy's kind of describing here and is the challenge that CFOs and treasurers have right now when deposits can just fly out the door. They've got to fund these loans, these assets with liabilities, and those liabilities are very expensive today. Yeah, and so a lot of bank deposits are still non-interest uh, uh, bearing, and I think that's related to uh, NOW or, or NOW accounts. And so those are, are businesses, as you say, not sensitive. And so much of bank net interest uh, income and profitability comes from P, uh, people uh, depositing money at zero. So banks get money at zero and they lend it out at four, five, six, seven percent. But if that money leaves and they have to replace it with bank term funding program from the Fed, discount window uh, from the Fed or the federal home loan bank, that is now five percent. So that net, net interest margin just sort of evaporates and ca can right. turn uh, negative. Another issue is tying. You referenced this earlier on indirect loans that banks can can make a lot of the reason you know you make a loan is oh the deposit will stay with me but if the deposit is leaving that advantage goes away and that's why you saw you know I was it, the Mark Zuckerberg founder of Facebook got a mortgage pretty close to 1% 1% from yeah, first because it, back the, in the day. it was kind of they're doing him a favor oh so now uh Facebook will Meta will keep their deposits there so it's a lot of you know uh, relationship uh, banking. favors relationship banking yes that's yeah. very common that's very common across all banking that was nothing nefarious, nothing illegal. That's right. a very common, everybody's looking at it like, oh, that should be, it's not. It's just, that's banking. It, it was even a strategy yeah. in the early 2010s, and, and Jamie Dimon was even out there saying that JP Morgan was gonna jump into it. It's no surprise to me that they were the one that took over First Republic either in that particular regard, but using the mortgage as a loss leader to get into wealth management, to get into banking and checking, to get into commercial lending, to get into HELOCs or credit card lending. The goal was to get as many fingers into the pie of the consumer as possible. And when you look at it, having eight different relationships throughout the entity with that borrower, it becomes a very sticky relationship. Mm -hmm. And they're not 
likely to leave um, you know, if, if they don't have to. Uh, the problem that both SVB and really First Republic had is when that loss of confidence came out and, and the, the flight of the deposits, the newsletter that was sent on, on SVB, or the investor letter, the shareholder letter, $42 billion in deposits gone in a week, right? Similar kind of thing, maybe not quite as quickly with First Republic, but as those deposits started to shift on them, it's hard to get the narrative back. Uh, and those are the things that CFOs are really having a battle right now. And to Randy's point about credit, how much is this slowing credit? So page three of that presentation, if you'd be so kind, Jack, kind of shows loan growth. This is from the FDIC. Um, and you can kind of start to see the trend. It's still positive. Things that I, you might take a look at right next to the red block where, where numbers actually go negative in that 2020 and 2021. That's really what I'm trying to highlight to everybody. That's when we locked down. That's when we stopped making loans because the world was going to come to an end because of the pandemic. That was the challenge that banks, depositories, credit unions, branch-based lenders just it, it showed it exposed the model, if you will. Uh, if you can just tab between the next slide real fast, going down one, there's the deposits coming in the door. Same window of time. You can see it almost looks like the Twin Towers there in, in 2020, right at the beginning of it. Deposits really kind of just kept flooding in. So there's all the money coming in. There's the margin pressure that we were talking about before and the rush to go take these deposits and lend them tab back up if you'd be so kind back to the loan growth, Jack. Um, you're starting to see where I have it circled. The trend is, is dropping. Uh, and the trend is dropping because of the previous page where the deposits are starting to run out the door. They've spent the money. It's gone. Now they're having to borrow again. When they have to borrow, it's that higher cost of funds. So you're starting to see that loan demand wane and I, I think Q1 was probably the high water mark for us, maybe uh, Q4. Uh, but one by one, as these regionals are starting to run out of cash, they're starting to kind of pull back on lending. And lending is the growth sector of the economy, or lending is what is what feeds the economy long term. So we're in the early innings of it, but it's coming. Sorry to interrupt. Wanted to let you know about BlockWorks' upcoming crypto event, Permissionless 2. This ultimate DeFi gathering will be taking place in Austin on the 11th to the 13th of September 2023. It will feature the very best discussions on ZK tech, rollups, account abstraction, MEV, and much, much more. All the big hitters in crypto are going to be there. So if you're into crypto, you need to be there too. To get a 20% discount to a full three-day pass to Permissionless 2, click the link in the description and use code GUIDANCE20. That's GUIDANCE20. Thanks. Let's get back to the episode. And what are you seeing in the commercial real estate world, lending against real estate that's in addition to offices, which are you know having a lot of fundamental issues, multifamily, sure. hospitals, all sorts of stuff like that. A lot of loans were made in, in 2020, 2021, 2022. <laughs> Tell us about the liquidity in that market, the discrepancy between quoted prices and actual prices, if there really are any actual prices, if you know if loans are even even trading at all. And how do you see that playing out as we have this refinance, you know, people will have to refinance over the, over the next two years. We just had our national conference in Atlanta a month or so back, and we had a commercial real estate panel. We had Moody's on there. We had a couple of regional lenders on there. We had Raymond James Bank uh, and their head of commercial lending. We had one of my commercial underwriters on. It was a really, it was a really interesting panel to kind of think through, um, you know, the challenges. So, one of the, the, the catchphrases that kind of left that conference was there's really only two types of commercial real estate trading right now, trophies and trash, um, which got a good chuckle out of the crowd, but it did really kind of summarize the market. Office is a good example, and, and you got to realize the commercial real estate market is, is enormous uh, in its size. And so geographic you know, location really, really matters. I mean, you've heard the joke with real estate location, location, location. But the, the lockdowns, uh, you know, San Francisco, as a good example, has been more impacted than, say, Atlanta um, or Tampa. Uh, you know, and, and certain areas are coming back and certain areas are really struggling. Um, but the trophies are still trading prime A-list quality multifamily because you can still get a premium for that loan. 
the trash is the other, you, you started to see some headlines come into the wall street journal and others where, um, you know, 50 cent haircuts on, on the values of, of these office complexes. And it's something that's, it's very visible. It's probably leaked into the press. The owner of that loan needs to get it off its books because it, there's headline risk. Uh, it has a trade in there, right, John? I mean, it well, has it, to offer. It, 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 I don't it's know starting to it. just work its way through. If you looked at, I mean, the number of transactions is way, 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 way down, like yeah. back to 2008 kind of way down. Um, and, and, you know, what we feel from customers is I'd, I'd like to sell this middle of the road, not the trophy, not the trash. I'd like to sell kind of this, you know, down the center of the fairway. The bid for that is 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 very weak because everybody's one running out of cash, two trying to manage the more problem part of their balance sheet, and they're trying to take large single assets. If you had a thirty million dollar office complex or a fifty million dollar office complex, and you can kind of quietly let it go off to the side, uh, something that might not make a press release to create any kind of smoke in the portfolio. Um, is really kind of the goal or or working out that particular loan, maybe in like an A-B structure with a with a hedge fund uh, where, you know, you, you retain a little bit of the risk, but you lay off the majority of the loan. You know, those kind of things are, are bubbling up and, and you're seeing them when they do finally reach the news, you're seeing pretty significant discounts. And what we're trying to really, really, really focus on right now Jack, you and I were talking about in the pre-call, loan to value is a is a waste of money. No, it's a waste of time. We don't even use that word. The only thing that truly matters today is cash flow. If it's an office um, and it was made three or four years ago, where are those leases? Where are those tenants? Are they renewing those leases? You know, have those leases expired and the building is half empty now? Uh, because that valuation is really driven by the cash flow of the property because debt yields cap rates back in, you know, 2019, when a lot of these loans were made very different now in today's market where coupons need to be seven, eight, nine percent and they're still down making loans at four five percent. Those loans are almost instantaneously at a loss. They might be relationship driven. Maybe there's deposits tied to them. Maybe it's extend and pretend where they're trying to work a loan out and they know they have a problem they're doing it on purpose. But really commercial real estate has not level set yet like the mortgage market has, and it needs to. And extend and pretend gets a bad rap, sometimes justifiably so, but you know, a banker doesn't necessarily want to be in the business of owning an office property. They, you know, they don't know, they don't want to have to reclaim the collateral and, and sell it. Sometimes it can be best to, you know, restructure and modify the loan. Uh, yeah. Well, 2008 taught us that, right? I mean, 2008 taught us that if we can, you know, not every loan truly goes bad. I mean, the hell of the pandemic for a moment there, right? When we all thought the world was just going to come to an end and nobody was ever going to come back to anything. Retail, hospitality, office has still been a bit of a dog. But had you sold the entirety of your hotel and retail book in, in June of 2020, I mean, those loans are probably money good right now in, in certain areas. Um, uh, you know, that might have been a bit too much of a knee jerk reaction. Um, so there are reasons and moments why extend and pretend works. There are some things that it's going to be a decade before some of these properties come back. Are, are you willing and are you able to live with it for that long? And, and Randy, you alluded to regulators before. I don't think regulators are going to let that happen for much longer. I think you're going to start to see some folks get written up for problem assets and risk weighted assets. And Cecil has also changed that a lot as well. You have to reserve enormous amounts of money for underperforming or subperforming loans. And that can start to be a real drag on earnings. It starts to make you know monetary sense to let go of these loans, get what capital you can get back and put it back to work. And what counts as an underperforming loan? Ooh. How long do you got? Um, <laughs> I mean, it could just be from an interest rate standpoint. I mean, if you have a 10-year final on a 25-year AM that you made in 2019, that's going to be a loan that hangs around till 2029 before you have to refine it. If you made it at 3.5% and your borrowing costs are now 4.5%, how long do you want to hang on to a loser? Right? So that's interest it's, rate It's risk perfectly risk paying. Right, not performing. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Now, the other side of the conversation is a, you know, an office complex in San Francisco that has a 20% lease on it. 
and you know it's no longer a 1.5 debt service coverage ratio it's a 0.6 um it's just not cash flowing um you know where, where can you sell that and who's willing to sit on that asset at what price for 10 years before it comes back so that valuation has to plummet before some hedge fund wants to jump in make a long-term bet on a property repurpose it it's why you're starting to see like in new york and other areas taking offices and turning them into residential that's that's a current play but that takes time uh, that takes investment that takes you know an influx of cash all of that has to kind of be factored in let me, let me john <clears throat> i want you to uh, 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 uh comment on something here please Fintwit, you know, I think naturally people are looking at, you know, when all these commercial loans that were made in 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, as they come to refi, everybody thinks, oh my God, the three and a half percent is now six and a half percent. And that's what they think is really terrible. To me, that's not the terrible part at all. Terrible part is particularly because you mentioned a cash flow building. We're not talking about sure. a home in Beverly Hills. We're talking about a building that provides cash flow. Yep. And if that cash flow is less and if cap rates are higher, it isn't so much the rate. It's the fact that I can't give you the same amount of money on that asset that I lent you five years ago. That Why? to me is the issue like that. The, the, I've had numbers run past me from people in the business going, you know, you might come in there on two million dollar building with one, a one point four million dollar loan and you might be able to get five hundred thousand. Yep. I mean, any kind of extend and pretend that's happening, Randy, the the, the sponsor, the guarantor has to put new equity in. I mean, um, most anybody I'm seeing now is saying, hey, you, you got to put some money down on this for us to extend it. Right. And I know or, these or guys and they just don't have that kind of equity. And that's that's kind of where the, particularly when we start talking about like a global debt service coverage ratio where they have multiple properties and, and right. you know, historically in commercial real estate, they move pools of money between, you know, winners and losers in their portfolio. I um, mean, that relatively common in commercial real estate and we've, um, we've had as, as they all start to fall there's no equity yeah. in any of their properties that they can pull out so that that's because they, they, they roll the equity into the next property to the next property to that you know it's, and there it is when the music stops too. and and we're talking right. about musical chairs and then eventually that chair gets pulled out from underneath you we're not there yet but we're 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 getting close and that's where you're starting to see the cmbs market which is really kind of seized up uh, although there's been a, a little bit of issuance of late, uh, but spreads are way wide. We're now starting to see some of those deals that we would never have gotten access to in the middle markets that would have always gone to the primaries, uh, but because they don't want to put them or don't qualify to put them into the bond anymore, they're coming to the depository. So, you know, a, an asset that uh, a good size trophy property that is for whatever reason doesn't work in CBS comes to the depository, they have a choice to make. I mean, do they want to make this? Can they can they get some deposits in return for making a loan? What rate should they charge? And that's where things get kind of interesting. If they're still as a regional or even a community depository only looking at their small community space and not necessarily seeing what we see where we see the entirety uh, of the market, if they're still making that underwater loan, Randy, and they go and they do that loan at five and a half percent when they should be asking for seven and a half, um, you know, those are kind of the value add of the analytics that we kind of quickly talk to somebody on where should they be making loan in the market today to make sure that they're earning the margin. And if they're forced to sell one day, you know, hopefully can make it uh, at a price that they need to not immediately making a loan at 92 cents on the dollar. So my understanding from what I've seen over the last 10, 15 years is, you know, going into 08, you know, like uh, IO, IO loans, commercial IO loans, where they're just interest only, interest only yep. five, yep. seven, 10 year kind of uh, maturities, even whatever the, you know, AM is, doesn't matter in this case. From what I'm seeing, that's dying. No, yeah, IO is never in depository land, never worked. And yeah, if you yeah. wanted to sell a loan with any real period of interest only, it, it's it's going to have a real hard time in the secondary market. Okay, so well, the, I, the reason that's so important to me again, I'm going to point to it again. It's going to be different from now on. It, it's now I'm not going to allow you to do an IO, which means you're going to only pay interest, which means your payments a lot less, which means Payment I chart. can take on a lot a bigger loan. Well, yep. now those are going to be dead. I've got it, and I'm not going to be able to afford the same kind of size 
because I'm going to have to pay interest and principal, thus less money to be borrowed, less money that I can take on. That's the theme I see. We're, is, we're, we're circling this whole pulling back on lending. We, yeah, you've gotten a real right. good feel of it here over the last several minutes on mortgage, on auto, on now commercial as well. Yeah. Um, and that, that's, that comes back to why lending is going to pull back. And that's the economy, man. That, I mean, I, you know, we, we see deposits going down. We see M2 going down. All of that's influenced both by QT and by, you know, lack of lending. And to me, I, you know, I, deflation is probably outside our scope here, but that's what I see coming. I don't know how we avoid actual deflation. Deflation. No, deflation. That's exactly right, Jack. The, the Fed wants you to use the word disinflation because it's not deflation. Deflation is CPI negative. Disinflation yeah. is CPI going from four to two. The rate, yeah, the rate of change, it. instead of going from four to 1%, it's going from four to negative 1%. Prices are exactly. actually declining. That's deflation. That's why the Fed keeps using the word disinflation because they're scared to death of deflation. And so I think in John's world, you know, lending creates money. Lending creates M2. And if they're going to slow that process down, I think even slowing is going to be an issue. But I've got bank CFOs that are trying to shrink. They they want to shrink because of everything John's been talking about with the you know with the funding. Well, let's add regulation for a second. If they're going to yeah. make a twenty percent increase in capital for the for the tier ones, and that'll probably sprinkle down to the hundred billion dollar banks that are more regional in size because of SVB. Now they've got to raise capital in this rising rate environment, which they're already struggling for funding, which means even less lending in that yeah. regard. John and Randy, there is an argument, I've seen it on a financial Twitter, and it takes a premise that is true, but it, it draws a conclusion which is contrary to what you're saying. So I'd love for you to sort of push sure. back on this. And that is, when a bank makes a loan, it creates money, it creates deposits. Deposits don't create loans, loans create deposits. So if banks are, you know, why would a fall in deposits cause a bank to stop lending? Why wouldn't it just make even more loans? Why is that thinking flawed, even though the underlying premise is, I suppose, technically correct? Well, we've had to encourage a number of our customers, let's just use indirect auto as the example. If you're going to make that loan, ask for the deposits. Don't just give them the loan without the deposits, right? So tie your lending to deposits today. And then I think maybe that argument kind of carries some weight. Otherwise, they may go bank elsewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you, you, maybe they go bank at B of A instead of, uh, you know, XYZ Community Bank. Um, you can say the same thing for mortgage. You can say the same thing for commercial real estate. Right. I guess the answer is they, they send the money elsewhere. The, the deposit doesn't, can leave. Yeah, I think that's a macro statement. And I think there's a, a, a lag and a flow to that where, yeah, if banks lend, they, they make deposits. But individually, if the bank is losing deposits, they cannot lend at the same, they don't have the money to lend, you know, and they don't, or they don't have the capacity to borrow or the spread between the borrowing and the lending rate is minuscule. So, I, you know. If we go it, back to, F, you know, uh, First Republic though, and even SVB back when all of the talk and, and the news headline was that, you know, all of the community banks were gonna die because everybody was going to take their deposits and just go put it in too big to fail in Bank of America. We never really experienced that. I didn't see lines out the door here in Memphis, Tennessee of, you know, my regional banks. And, and so to me, that was, and the math has shown that, yeah, a little bit of money went to the, the tier ones and the, and the very large, but that's largely kind of starting to recover. And I still think relationship banking that Randy has mentioned before is still a, a, the lifeblood, certainly of small business. I just think some of these community and regional lenders have got to get better at asking for more, a bigger share of the deposits, as opposed to letting those dollars run out the door on them. Right. And Randy, you said something which, you know, some in my audience may quibble with, the banks don't have the money to lend. So technically, you know, in an unregulated banking system, banks can create money whenever they want and just lend money. But there's something called regulation and banks you know, they can't just lend uh, ad finitum. They have to have a certain amount of capital to lend against that, that's right. right? So that's what you're saying. And in the yeah. practical world of banking, which, you know, you two are experts in banking, I, I am not, pe people understand that. 
Yes. Um, I mean, yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but like I said, cash, you know, money is being destroyed in many different ways right now. And that has to mean less lending. You know, I, it, 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 and it, that's my whole point of all these different things going on. Banks are going to lend less and they're going to lend in, in a different way. I, I wonder who the hell wants to own a 30 year mortgage on their books right now when, you know, the whole idea, look, the whole idea of interest rate risk is now a new thing. You know, you know, John, you didn't see this, but Jack had this lovely interview with uh, Vincent uh, Daniel Vinny from the big short, who was just outstanding. And mm -hmm. one of the three people in all the universe that seems to understand banking. And, you know, he said, look, you know, Jack made the point that we see it, that when rates go higher, that's good for banks. Yet banks are getting beat up. Well, and you, you mentioned this earlier, John, and Vinny mentioned it as well. It's the speed that happens, right. the it's speed at which yeah. the pace and all the assets are stuck. And, and, you know, and the, the new lending is coming down and they're, you know, durations being beat up. Interest rate risk now is going to be a thing. And let me tell you, interest rate risk on a 30 year mortgage on your books is going to be really ugly. Now, there's interest rate risk on a two year auto loan right now, well, which is bizarre. Oh, yeah, course, right. I mean, when auto rates double over the course of a year that that I've never seen that before. But like I had banks buying 30 year, you know, agency collateral. Sure. Not a lot of them, but I had because they needed they needed the yield. You know, they're going to cash flow. Da, 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 da. Well, God, they're never going to do that again, ever. Sure. So well, that goes back to my comment as to we were focused on earnings in that moment. And, and we had to extend, make 30 year loans or longer commercial yeah. real estate. And that was very much the rage in 21. Yeah. Uh, it was, I mean, nobody wanted short duration assets with no margin and no yield. Right. In and hindsight. Right. right to get the yeah. like so when you talk of commercial loans, hey, so and so will offer me three years IO. Uh, okay, we'll do that. Oh, so and so is now at five years. Now they're at seven. Now they're at ten. And by the way, all that used to be hedge, right, John? If yeah. if oh, a bank was going to do that, <laughs> no, no, hedge, no, and no. there was a penalty to prepay that loan. Yeah. So right. really, the cost of that hedge was going to the borrower, and then they just gave up on that. It seems, and they're like, okay, we'll do it. Because they had so know, much cash and they were trying to push loans out the door. Exactly. Exactly. John, John, you said nobody's hedged. That's the point Randy has made. You know, there are a lot of very smart people who you know worked at hedge funds, doing a lot of interest rate swaps, and worked at very large institutional banks, which which do you know hedge. I mean, they create the interest rate swaps and all these things. But in your world, the banks fifty billion dollars and less, sometimes a little bit larger. You say nobody hedges. Just walk. Us I mean. Down. I mean, mortgages, uh, you know, before the rate hike, uh, prepayment speeds were 40 CPRs, if not higher. So 40% of the portfolio is prepaying in a year. Why would you hedge that? And you were just, it was, it was a waste of money. It was a waste of margin. You were, you needed all the margin you can. The duration of the asset was four years and in. Um, there's no point in hedging it because it's going to prepay. And you know, it's easy to say hindsight 2020 when we got into the 250, 275, 3% kind of 30 year fixed rate mortgages, you know, maybe we are starting to put on some duration and some, some interest rate risk, but you know, inflation was transitory. We weren't, we weren't worried about a, a 400 basis point move overnight. So uh, the majority of our customers stopped hedging uh, because of the churn. I mean, we, we're talking about a $13 trillion mortgage market that in two years, half of the market refied. I mean, $8 trillion in mortgages made in two years. And you're working from home and everything's a little bit more difficult because of the pandemic and the speed at which everything was happening. Yeah. Hedging wasn't even on anybody's radar. And, and, when, and when, when it was too late, when the, when the Fed panicked and said, well, we got to start taking care of inflation. Oh, go try to hedge that brother. It's going to cost you a <laughs> yeah. It's way too late. Yep. And John, you'd say a, a bank that fully hedged a 500 basis point increase in interest rates in one year, that with the benefit of hindsight, that would have been fantastic, but you can't always yeah. be preparing for such a, you know, you can't be I always preparing money. if you're an equity investor, you know, buying VIX futures so much. So if you were quote fully hedged for March, 2020, you'd be paying like 3% in premium every year and you'd end up with no money. I mean, I'd, I'd love to say that every one of our customers did nothing but short-term lending and short-term securities purchases all the way throughout this and rode the curve all the way up. I don't know of a single customer in the country that did that. JP Morgan did a pretty good job, but they're- it's just not, Jack, it's not a bank. 
It's, it's, I hate when they bring up JP Morgan or even Wells Fargo, for God's sakes. I mean, they're conglomerates. They have so many different profit centers. And like you said, they write the derivatives. So which means, you know, it's sort of like it's, you know, you go back to Vinny, ask Vinny, yeah. you know, all the CDOs, you know, Goldman and all the big, bank. guess what? All of that was hedged into AIG. They can well, do and, that. You know, and and I should, again, my customers are, are kind of that 175, 50 billion and right. down. They're, they're a less sophisticated counterparty, right? There's, there's not necessarily a need as much as, and they certainly don't have an entire derivatives desk uh, that are kind of managing the risk of that. And Randy, so Bank of America, which does have a lot of unrealized secu- losses on securities, their hedging, so much of their hedging is in actually the uh, their deposit costs not going up and that they can make uh, loans at higher yields. So I think, I mean, as of their most, re- their, their rates that they're paying on um, individual deposits, their spot deposit rate, I think is still below 1%. And they're, you know, Making loans that goes back to that sticky bottom I showed in the First Republic piece. Exactly. That, that, and so Bank of America, they really are money centers. So the argument, oh, rising rates are good for banks, for Bank of America, you're seeing that. But all the region, not all the regional, but some regional banks, it's happened so fast. Deposit costs have gone from 0% right. to 2.5, 3%. And they're just not yeah. able to make that amount of loans. Because guess what? No one wants to borrow money at 10%. Listen, you had Chris Wallen on and you had, uh, you know, Vincent Daniel, and they said the same thing. It's the speed. And what Chris Wallen kept saying is just banks need time. Give them time and the assets will slowly, the, the get low yielding up. assets will roll off. It'll go into higher yielding assets. That's right. They just need time. And I think John will agree sooner or later, the Fed's going to cut rates. Yeah, It's just, you know, I, I, and I, I think, this is why banks are going to continue to get beat up. And at some point, I think the Fed's going to be forced to, to kind of save them. But in the end, if they just have time, they'll be OK. If you have a run on a bank, time's up. It's over. So I don't care who, what bank you are. Hey there. Sorry to interrupt. A lot of Forward Guidance listeners are not into crypto. If that's you, please skip ahead. Get back to the interview. Some Forward Guidance listeners are into crypto. Some own crypto, a smaller percentage owning lots of crypto and a much smaller percentage work at crypto hedge funds. If you're in those latter two categories, BlockWorks Research might be a good fit for you. BlockWorks Research is a research and data platform that analyzes governance, tokenomics, and models of interesting crypto projects, including new protocols. There's a lot of edge that can be gained from reading these reports. You can check out a sample report at www.blockworksresearch.com slash research and hit the free report toggle. If that is of interest, full subscriptions can be purchased at www.blockworksresearch.com slash sign dash up. You can also get 10% off using the discount code guidance 10. Thanks. And let's get back to the interview. John, do you agree with Randy that the Fed eventually will will have to cut rates on your blog post on LinkedIn? I know you you wrote about uh, Nick Timoros's work, who, you know, you you follow quite closely. Fed whisper. Yeah. Yeah. We have to. Yeah. 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 I mean, he's the guy who le- who releases the leak, right? I mean, he's the dude. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, uh, we got a gift today in the jobs number, right? Uh, uh, higher than expected job losses, which yeah. likely gives uh, Powell cover for the skip. Um, then we have CPI and PPI on deck. Uh, if we get a hot CPI number, I think July is back on the on the table, and you probably have a twenty five basis point hike. If we can get a break here, I do agree with Randy's comment. We just really, really need just a break. Uh, just let the let assets settle, let more current coupons come online, let those older coupons kind of work their way off. But if we can get a little bit of a breather uh, and 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 get away from the inflation numbers and get through the summer, I think it's going to be politically very difficult uh, for Powell to continue hiking any further. Uh, don't forget, we're getting into the election season here soon, too. I know the Fed's not uh, political, but um, oh, no. yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, then hopefully we start to see a cut in the first quarter of 24. Um, I, I mean, I think we're here for a minute, though, Jack. Uh, and I don't think that until unless we see credit crack, if we saw, you know, unemployment skyrocket uh, and we saw credit performance start to deteriorate, Again, that's the genie he can't put back in the bottle, but I think he holds it here probably for the remainder of 23. I'm not happy to say that, but that's just what I think happens. And John, in 2013, 2015, 
were you paying as much attention to oh, rates? No. Because yeah, you're in the 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 heart, the aorta of the financial system. Not you know someone like me who's talking Fed this, Fed that. You know, it's kind of you know you're not paying attention to where the wind is blowing because you're focused on on the real work. But the wind is very relevant now. It's the Fed, right? I mean, it's the only thing that matters. It's the only conversation today. I'm not an economist. I'm a trader, but I find myself listening to the Fed governors, Powell in particular. Uh, you know, watching you know the the three metrics that he's been so focused on with inflation and jobs, um, and, and you know where that kind of drives uh, you know his forecasts. And so many of our customers are desperate for the pivot. Back to my comment, all of this unrealized losses. It's just funny math. It's just accounting math, right? With a two hundred basis point drop in rates, all of those unrealized losses vanish, right? Um, so that that's what clients are just so desperate to see is when is that pivot coming because they believe it's here tomorrow because the credibility of the Fed over the last couple of mini crises has been you know less than stellar. I actually think this time he he holds the line for a little while to to try to squash inflation as long as he can. And that's the terrible part of it, Jack, is that would would you know I've got my clients going and boards like say I do board meetings. I'm like I'll say hey look you know if rates went down 200 and your loss was either wiped out or cut in half, would you be thrilled? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, how come? Oh, our bonds are doing better. No, nothing has changed with your bonds or your loans. What actually has changed now is, is every dollar you roll off is now gonna earn 200 basis points less. So really, you know, we need a better shape of the curve is out of whack for banks, but we can't, if going back to zero is no good either. You know, so we need an environment that creates some cash flow get some, you know, refis going, and then these guys can start to reinvest at these higher rates. Income will improve. Higher rates allow banks' income to improve, and that's real. The unrealized losses is a fantasy unless they have a run on the bank and they're forced to sell, okay? But all those unrealized losses, particularly in my world that are backed by government, they'll go to par. They'll go to par when they go to maturity. The losses magically go away. But um, you said magic fantasy. The, the fantasy is becoming... a reality right john That's because right. if you have yeah. 10 million of loans on your books and you know you can only sell them for 70 you can ignore that you know that that discrepancy for a while but you may have to realize it right john and, and so now um, i'm concerned we've had svb signature first republic you know the the list is out there and um the the, the silver gate we're, we're now the finger's starting to get pointed at the FDIC. The figure's now starting to get pointed at, at the auditors saying, hey, you knew about this and you didn't enforce anything. And, and now I think that next round of exams for depositories, it's not going to be, hey, I see this and it's okay. You've got your arms around it. Hey, that unrealized loss, go make it realized. Go manage this now. Um, and, and only did we hear that from people kind of coming out of their, if you think about it, you know, SVB wasn't that long ago, First Republic wasn't that long ago, every quarter or every six months as these audits kind of work through, folks who have just gotten on the other side of an audit after SVB are now starting to tell me, yeah, they're, they're kind of mad. Uh, this was not a this was not a fun audit. And, and we've been given some action items uh, to, to clean up. So, so you're hearing that the regulators are saying, recognize that loss and only in the last two weeks from three customers randy have i been told that? even though it's an interest rate loss it's not a manage loss, right? manage Man, higher for longer loss, but, but. manage higher for longer sell wow what, what is recognizing that solve uh you know limiting the overall exposure uh maybe maybe randy I mean, I'm, I'm biased from having just interviewed Sheila Bear and, and reading her book, but if the loss isn't realized, they can, the balance sheet is bigger, they can borrow more against it, and they borrow it in discount window, FHLB, BTFP, those, if the, a bank goes under, those uh, are securitized borrowing. So it, the more FHLB, and correct me if I'm wrong, and discount window and BTFP, the more the FDIC is on the hook, because those are collateralized borrowings. That's a good point. And that's probably what it is, John. You're right. You guys eat the loss now. So in case we don't want to have to deal with it. So go ahead and eat it now, survive and eat some of it at least. 
go start and raising more capital. Some of it, don't though, don't pull an SVB, down. right? Don't go sell right. the portfolio. Don't raise, you know, do the obvious. Start start Never raising. Pull an SVB. Right. Don't pull an SVB. But raise the capital first. Do the sale. Right. And and John, and way, I guess SVB was doing the. They were doing the right thing. They they were absolutely. They just doing did the it right in the thing. wrong just, order. They lost <laughs> yeah. the control of the narrative. Right. They, right. Right. Yeah. That you know. And then all hell broke loose. But but again, that's a run. You know, it, 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 avoid a run. And time will heal. Very unique bank too, with very wealthy, yeah. very well-to-do yeah. borrowers. I mean, yeah. I don't think most of our flyover state depositories have forty-two billion dollars with a couple of hedge fund managers, right? Well, so I've got a client in Silicon Valley, and, and they're they're losing deposits rapidly, and and they've said we our clientele is is more astute, they're smarter, they pay more attention. You know, it's they're very quick to act when they have the ability to earn more money. Um, and we've so, talked about this with a lot of customers. The last time deposit rates were this high, this thing wasn't invented. Yep. That's true. <laughs> That's a good point. Right. So the speed at which yeah. you can look up, yeah, you know, where competitive levels are and move it. Yeah. And so, so John, First Republic in California, Silicon Valley Bank, obviously in California, Randy just spoke of, a, of another bank, you know, unnamed anonymous in California, how much of the issues in banking are uh, uh, concentrated in the West Coast where, you know, people may perhaps a little bit more tech savvy. They spend a lot of time on Twitter. The, the bank run can go like this. Real estate's having a lot of issues. There's some secular problems with California. I mean, you know, where you're located in Tennessee, I'm in New York. Is the middle of the country in the East Coast maybe a little, uh, the issues a little less severe than- We, we did the joke there for a minute that if your name had West in it, that for whatever reason, anybody with the name West in it seemed to be kind of in the spotlight, right? So, and I think that's just the nature of some of the banking relationships that are out on the West Coast. I, I don't know that the flyover states have as much of those issues. I mean, that's it's a broad statement of generality, but, um, you know, again, it, it's, it's not a credit problem. It's if we we talk this about, about this a lot here on the desk. Uh, you know, it, it's the spotlight. And if you're a CFO, what's the playbook? When your name, for whatever reason, gets into the media's mouth, and, and they start to put you on CNBC, uh, and you're having to kind of talk through it. Have my deposits gone down? Yes or no? If no, what's your plan? We're having an aggressive CD special or having, you know, relationship lending and drawing in more deposits. We're looking at the various mm -hmm. different forms of warehouse liabilities, uh, wholesale liabilities that are out there. We've managed the BTFP. We've managed the discount window. Um, you know, we, we're, we're, we're on top of it, right? And then saying whatever you can to get that spotlight on to the next guy. Uh, there was even a little joke in Let's Talk Loans a couple of weeks ago. It's kind of like the going and seeing the bear, and the t-shirt that says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you, right? That's kind of the banking system yeah. right now. If your name's the name on CNBC, get your name out of their mouth and get it on somebody else. Because I've that's, had that, banks, get that spotlight off you. I've had community banks, several now, auditors have come in and said, what are you doing to monitor social media? I, that's incredible to me. I mean, th well, now here's did you notice the number of tweets and the number of LinkedIn posts on how safe and sound institutions were after SVB? It sounded like just a parade of institutions that had press releases on That's that. That's true. You yeah. never want the CEO on TV saying we're liquid, we're solvent. That that doesn't end well. There's there's a, I'm not going to say who it is, but there's a CEO that is prolific on Twitter and talking about here's how we're different. Here's how we're different. I'm like, you need to get off Twitter, man. Yeah. No, yep. You need to be quiet. You don't, people don't need hide. to know who, hide, just hide. hide. And no, that's the, the blessed news for most of our customers are not public institutions, that's right? True. So there's no real reason for the spotlight to be shined on their balance sheet, Jack. Not publicly it's, traded. It, correct. Yeah. Most of these institutions, private institutions, but when you do start getting into those public institutions that, you know, do have to do their press releases, that's when you start to see the volatility. That's when you see, oh, deposit outflows. Oh, well, tell me about your commercial exposure. Oh, well, tell me about your mortgage exposure. What are your marked markets? The moment those questions start coming up, giddy up. It, it gets real, it gets real dicey. That's such a good point, John, because I imagine if there's a bank that, you know, suddenly their new, their spot cost of defunding is basically at 4% and they're, you know, making not enough, uh, their net interest margins have suffered. Okay, the, it's a family-owned bank, or it's a, it's owned privately owned. They can put a little bit more capital in. They can stomach the you know net interest income losses for for a little bit, and it's it's no big deal. 
But if that happens to the publicly traded stock, the stock goes from 100 to 8. Suddenly, people who are depositors at that say, hey, why is the stock at 8? I'm going to withdraw my money. Oh, I'm going to withdraw my uninsured deposit. Oh, I'll take my insurance deposit with it. And it's this. What are you going to say? How do you control that narrative circled in red? And that TTI is time to insolvency. Time to insolvency. Because this happened. This was real. But that's a run. Right. I mean, it is, but as long as it can be a social media created kind of phenomenon, if your yeah. name gets in their mouth on and, and I think we're through that. I do believe we're, we're probably on the back end of it, well, but a CFO has got to have the narrative to talk around. Okay. I've managed this net interest margin issue that I have. Yeah. And John, so based on what I've seen, which is publicly available to anyone. So banks, uh, some troubled banks had outflows from, March 10th to let's say maybe the middle of March or, or early April. And then, you know, the Western alliances, other banks, they saw uh, deposits actually go back into the bank. So from sure. now until June, based on what's been publicly released, uh, they have gone up. Have you in the private data, have you seen deposit uh, uh, continue to go back into those trouble banks? You know, look at the uh, page five, if you could jump back up one. Um, I mean, you can start to see kind of where the borrowings are, right? Broker deposits, non-broker deposits. I mean, it, it is shifting. It wasn't as maybe overblown as, you know, 10, 15% of deposits flowing out the door to Bank of America. It was 2 to 3%, right? So it was, a, it was a relatively manageable number. I think that's a good question, Jack, to watch in Q2 earnings. And I'm sure a lot of bank analysts are going to be following just exactly that question is, how much of the BTFP discount window, federal home loan bank, wholesale borrowings did you take on compared to your own retail deposits? And what's your NIM look like? What's your net interest margin now? You know, like, you know, net interest margins all came down for the most part in Q, Q1, but the ball only got rolling halfway through Q1. Now the ball's fully going downhill and it's building. And so I'm going to be really curious to see what net interest margins look like Q2. And that's where you could, unfortunately, I think, you might see some some banks get in a little bit of a situation there. And one way this could end with a, with a happy ending is uh, bar, banks are able to make loans at, at higher yields. Oh, I will uh, uh, pay 11% of my auto debt. Oh, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll pay 9%. If there's demand for, for credit with uh, higher loans and banks are able to pass off those those funding costs, it could go well. I mean, what, John, are you seeing is the demand for credit at high interest rates? I mean, it's that's part of why it's slowing, right? The, I mean, uh, Experian's news the other day on new auto loans, the fact that 15 to 17% of new auto loans have a $1,000 a month payment. That's a mortgage. Jesus. <laughs> that's, a, that's a mortgage for most people, right? But I mean, that, that, I mean, that has to slow things down when you're talking about 8, 9, 10% auto rates on vehicle prices that are 40, 50, 000, you know, thousand dollars now, right? Because of inflation and the price of you new and used cars. So, I mean, there's a lot of people, one, it's why I watch the Fed so much is which is the direction of rates these days and, and how's that going to get passed on to borrowers and what those borrowing costs are going to be. And then again, if we do hit the skids, if we do see something worse than a soft landing on, on this, now we're talking about much higher coupons and the inability of consumers to support that debt on a big payment as a part of their monthly nut, their debt service coverage for their own personal, you know, I mean, consumer lending is an increasing portion of their monthly payment uh, of their total income for the month. So you gotta, you gotta factor that in is that if, if we don't have anything better than a soft landing, we could really start to see credit start to crack. Mm-hmm. And so I guess if, Banks, they are willing to make loans just at 9% instead of 6%. That's one story. But based on this Bloomberg headline, Randy, that you sent me and John, at Bill Ackman back builder, Howard Hughes says that they 48 lenders rejected their apartment building. They're trying to build a, a multifamily early innings. apartment. Yep, you're in the yep. early innings. Yeah, apartment project, and they got rejected. He said, zero banks showed up and gave me a bid. I talked to 48 of them. So it sounds like maybe uh, Howard Hughes would have been willing to pay 9%, but the banks aren't even willing to do that. They're not even giving them the money. That's back to the pulling back on land. So yeah. in those examples, we would have attacked that a little differently. We probably would have broken that up into bite sizes, 
uh, and maybe even done single loans. And it would have been work and you'd had to roll your sleeves up and get after it as opposed to one large pool of however many assets and try to find local lenders that are out there that might have been a better source because they could potentially bank or it was in their footprint in which they were comfortable with. Um, as opposed to just here's a here's a multitude of property. Let's go do kind of a of a, a mini CMBS deal. But out of the forty eight lenders uh, that didn't show up, don't you think some of those guys said, uh, you know, no, not one hundred percent, but I'll do ten percent of the deal. Probably. And so now you're talking about a syndication uh, right. or a participation of loans. You start to get into legal lending limits. Uh, and again, this is this is where you know the whole loan market is a bit more work. Uh, again, having to kind of roll up your sleeves and get after it a bit, as opposed to, I'm just going to put 500 million into a CMBS deal and I'm going to pass it to a couple of hedge funds, money managers, and bulge bracket institutions. And John, these commercial real estate loans, how many of them are floating interest rates? So if you made them at 3%, it's no problem that interest rates are at now went from 0% to 5% because now you're earning 8% on those yields. Yeah, that, that is a growing percentage. It's higher than, say, the mortgage market. That's the good news for the resi market is almost everything is fixed rate. So rising rates doesn't really do anything to the consumer. But you're right, Jack. It's a much larger percentage. I don't know the number offhand in commercial real estate that is more floating debt. Got it. So with what level of confidence, John, would you say that credit will continue to contract? In which sector? In commercial? Yes. Uh, high. Um, in Subprime auto, uh, subprime credit card, high. Um, as an example, we haven't even talked about student loan debt uh, turning back on on August 1st. That's $300 a month on average payment. Uh, and they haven't made that payment in two years. So has somebody already spent that $300 a month somewhere else? And now all of a sudden they've got to turn that back on. How's that going to go? I think that's going to go poorly. And I think that's on younger borrowers and on lower credits. And we're already seeing the cracks in lower and younger borrowers with cards and lower and younger credit borrowers with um, with autos. Uh, Resi's damn near bulletproof right now, and that's just a function of very low payments and very low rates. I think yeah. Resi's actually the winner this time around if we have a, a credit cycle. Commercial real estate, I mean, multifamily and industrial probably do well. Uh, office is is obviously the one that's been pretty well documented is in, is in some real trouble, and parts of hospitality, um, you know, places where folks aren't going anymore will struggle, uh, whereas places where the you know people are still wanting to travel. If you've traveled lately, but most every hotel and every airline is is packed out right now, so uh, they seem to be doing better than maybe where we were in the pandemic days. Talk to me about credit card. You said cracks are starting to show in subprime credit card. I know for a long time, delinquencies in credit cards were super low, way lower than in 2019. I mean, the economy was very strong, 2021, 2022. Um, but what are you seeing now in, the, in those cracks? And then also, I didn't ask you about credit cards because when you say whole loans, you know, credit yeah. card is kind of each, every, every you know, it's, it's all you know, small loans to individuals. So I, I didn't know that you were in that. Yeah, whole, whole loan would mean anything not in a bond. Uh, okay. So, I mean, you could take hundreds of thousands of credit cards and put them into a bond if you wanted to, but I would just be taking the package of the raw loans and moving from bank to bank uh, or credit union or thrift or fund or REIT or insurance company, whoever it might be. So um, yeah, credit cards are the tip of the spear, right? Unsecured personal lending, um, FinTech lending and um, and credit cards are, are that piece of the pie that maybe you're doing debt consolidation, uh, maybe you're just doing you know personal spending, uh, but what we've seen so far in the data from a lot of the credit bureaus, younger uh, borrowers with less savings um, and, you know, maybe less earning power and, um, and, and lower credit are starting to now see delinquency rates above pre-pandemic levels, which to me, I mean, there's two times the credit card debt, credit card debt that's using to drive positive growth, or there's the credit card debt that's just somebody trying to keep up with the Joneses and keep their nose above water. I get the sense it's a little bit more of trying to keep their nose above water. I mean, when we're done, I, I mean, I'm going to want to point to John's LinkedIn commentary. I think Pete, you got to you got to read it. You know, everybody in Finswood should read it because, like everything you've seen here, he's he's got his finger on the pulse before anybody else does. And you know, I, I personally, of course, look, I'm a pessimist. I'm a bond guy. We're all that way. But I hope to temper people's enthusiasm. I mean. My opinion, and we talked about it earlier with, with John, is that 
you know, when we see credit problems or whatever, well, we kind of already did. We had three or four bank failures. That was pretty catastrophic. Some of the biggest in history. My opinion is, is it, until it shows up in the stock market, I, I think the Fed's going to hold rates where they are. And, in, and unless we get some limit down days, as long as that doesn't happen, I think the Fed is, is you know, they're, they're clearly okay with more bank failures, which I think is tragic, but that's, that's, and it, to me, it's the environment they've created. Well said. There we go. Um, well, it's been, it's been great getting both of you on. Uh, Randy, thanks for, for helping getting John on. John, it was, it was wonderful to meet you. And I'm, I'm really glad that you, you shared your expertise with, with me and, and our audience. Uh, if I could ask you a, just a final question, John, Please. why do you think lending over the past uh, six months has not been worse, sort of the counterfactual, because banks still are making loans and, and you know, what, what, why do you think the, there hasn't been a, a true sort of drastic pullback yet, even if you kind of expect a, a more significant pullback? Most of our customers believe the Fed is going to cut soon. Um, it's kind of what I call the rainbow, right? Mm -hmm. Don't worry about right now. If you go to sleep today and you wake up six months from now, rates are going to be back down. Um, and they don't believe the Fed will hold rates higher for longer. They haven't believed that for six to nine months. So they have continued to make loans and maybe even at tighter and tighter and tighter margins. And they're only just now coming around to that kind of, oh gosh, moment where, ooh, you know, maybe I should have locked in some lower cost liabilities 12 months ago. Um, you know, maybe I should have been a bit more proactive on asking for deposits over the last 12 months. As, as the, the realization of the CFO and the treasurer that we've talked so much about in this last hour, as it kind of comes to fruition, that I'm, I'm flat out of cash. I got nothing and I got to go borrow and my borrowing cost is here. That's truly working its way through the regional system. And, and that's where those lending volumes are starting to kind of hit the wall. And, and, and if this continues, which... Pal says it's going to. Most of my banks are, I don't have maybe one out of 50 want to continue to grow. And they're in different unique situations. Most of the, are where, yeah, we're not growing. And then I've got another probably 10, 15% that says, no, we, we got to shrink. We got to shrink. And All of that means, yeah. And remember, it's like, I think you said this earlier, uh, Jack, and I know Vinny said it many times, it's, it's the rate of change. So just the slowing is going to have ramifications. You know, it, it, I quoted one of my favorite movies, Margin Call, this morning on Twitter. It's great. It, it, the music doesn't have to stop. It just has to slow. And there will be ramifications. In, in reference to Big on? Short earlier, uh, I can't watch that movie. I lived that one, the, the 2008 <laughs> mortgage crisis. That one's just a little too real for me, um, although great film, a great book. Um, is it, it, it's, we're still, Jack, we're still in the early innings on this. Uh, and to me, the only thing that I'm watching is credit. Um, again, Powell can fix most of this with a rate cut. If we hold higher for longer and student lending turns back on and the consumer starts to slow and spending starts to slow and unemployment rate starts to go up, um, and, and credit gets back out like it got back out in 2008, probably more in commercial than in, in residential, probably more in consumer credit than in, um, you know, unsecured credit. It, you can't put that back. And, and that's when uh, I'm, that's the, really the only thing I'm hunting for right now is credit performance. And just want to ha hammer home a point of Randy, you said banks don't want to grow. A lot, or, you know, one, only one in 50 banks want to grow. A lot of them, they would love to grow if they could make loans at 12%. Well, that's true. It's, well it's, said. it's, it's yeah. just that in order to grow, they have to make that's loans that's at 6% true. and they don't want to do that. And well, John, they don't want to grow having banks, to borrow money. To the, John, to the extent that uh, banks are still lending, they are lending at those lower rates, some of which, as you say, are, you know, are go underwater the minute they're made. You know, that ties back to the relationship banking. Uh, but they do so because they expect the Fed will lower rates so that that net income uh, uh, interest and that, uh, that interest margin can be preserved. Yep. Well, right. gentlemen, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you everyone for watching. Oh, John. So, so John, um, yes. where can people uh, find your, your blog? Um, yep. uh, Let's Talk Loans. It's on LinkedIn. On and LinkedIn. Yeah. Look for me, John Tuig, T-O-O-H-I-G. Uh, and then on Twitter, RJ Whole Loans. Admittedly, Randy is much more proficient at Twitter than I am. Uh, I need more characters. I'm a little bit more verbose uh, in how I write. But uh, yeah, LinkedIn, uh, look for me at John Tuig uh, is where you can find the majority. I have a newsletter out there and I'm very active, two or three posts a day. 
Yep, you, you uh, write great work on LinkedIn and Randy's is big on, on Twitter. So John, uh, on Twitter, you gotta start writing threads and you know, do, yes. do 100. I got, I got some work to do. I acknowledge I have some work to do, yes. Yeah, there we go. Well, uh, thanks again, talk soon. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at Blockworks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined. Also, you can get 10% off to Permissionless 2023 and Blockworks Research using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks again and be well.